uh, this whole show today is going to be about ranked choice voting, and uh, we're going to be kicking things off. I will talk about ranked choice voting, but I want to kind of lead up to why I want to talk about ranked choice voting. Why I think that this is going to be, um, in my opinion, the better way to move forward with our uh, election processes. Um, we have a big problem with our current election system. And uh, the big problem with our current election system right now is that it's corrupt, it's laundered with money, and both sides play this game. Um, it's actually not a democratic system. It is, a, uh, it is an oligarchical plutocratic system. It is a system that is governed by money, that uh, essentially rigs the rules, essentially bends and breaks the rules in various different ways to ensure that the candidate with the most corporate legitimacy wins. Not the candidate that the people have decided that they want, but the candidate with the most corporate legitimacy. And in 2016, that was Trump. Trump, in 2016, ended up being the candidate with the most corporate legitimacy that won. In the Democratic Party, uh, Hillary Clinton was the candidate with the most corporate legitimacy, uh, and uh, and they stole the election from Bernie. They they one hundred percent stole the election from Bernie, and they did it again. They did it again in twenty twenty. You know, um, the kind of hope that I had for twenty twenty going in, uh, why I put my backing behind candidates like Tulsi Gabbard. Um, you know, and, and I, I took a lot of shit for supporting Tulsi Gabbard. I took a lot of shit for supporting Bernie Sanders in fucking 2016. It took a lot of shit for it. And, but the reason why I supported those candidates is because one, they seemed genuine and two, they were saying stuff that I believed in. Um, and you know, had Tulsi Gabbard had an R by her name, I, and she was saying the exact same things that she was saying, I would have supported her at that point too. Um, you know, because she was talking about anti-militarism. She was talking about how economics is used in terms of warfare. She was talking about how uh, foreign policy and domestic policy are interlinked, interlinked with each other. And I believe all those things. Those are all the things that, you know, I, I had been talking about in my, in my stand-up, in my videos, um, you know, uh, getting away from this, this corporate party being, being more, so I, I was kind of talking about these populist ideas. So I believed in those things and I wanted to support a candidate and cast a vote based on my beliefs as I think it should be, as I think that's what democracy should be. And that's what you should be doing when you are casting a vote. You should be casting a vote for somebody or for an idea that you believe in. Now there are members in the DNC, I was watching a video and I should have written this fella's name down, uh, older gentleman, part of the DNC, part of the Democratic National Committee. And he, um, he kind of like made fun of people that, that, that said that they wanna vote with their belief systems. Right. He was like, oh, you're being childish. It's childish to think that you can vote for your belief systems. You should vote for who we tell you to. That's the attitude that the DNC has. Right. Um, and. And because people were voting with that belief, system, that's why they went after Bernie Sanders as much as they did. So the Democratic Party plays this game where they rig the primary system against anybody that has like more progressive ideals, more democratic socialist ideals, more, you know, far, far more left than what the Democratic Party actually is, um, you know, and with Bernie Sanders, they did that by uh, manipulating the results. You know, what the machine results were, were saying did not match the exit poll results. Um, in this election alone, you had people like Lee Camp talking about it. You had whistleblowers from the electoral process talking about it. Uh, exit poll numbers in Texas, the state of Washington, Massachusetts, Minnesota, all of these uh, compared to the machine votes, the machine votes were, were showing between 4 and 8% off. The exit poll results were showing that the machine results were, were 
4 to 8% off. In order for you to redo an election, to redo the, the casting of the vote process, uh, the threshold is 2%. If it's off by 2%, if if the exit poll says one number and then the machine votes say another number and those numbers are are off by 2%, they have to redo it. We're looking at exit poll numbers that are showing that the machine votes were off by 4 to 8%, 2 to 4 times larger than what is the actual threshold. And the Democratic Party was like, no, 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 no. Joe Biden won those states. No, he didn't. There was, in Texas alone, 4% of the vote showed that there was a discrepancy between Biden and Bernie votes. And then by, uh, and then Bernie and, uh, uh, fuck, what was that rich billionaire's name that no one cares about? I forgot his name because he's so irrelevant in my mind. Bloomberg. That's how much his money matters. Like, But my brain was just like, you're not a relevant person, you slave labor using piece of shit. <laughs> um, but they were 4% off just in Texas alone, right? And this, this and, and, and then in Dallas County, they reported that four, 44 USBs of voters, uh, of votes were just uncounted. Wonder who those votes were for, right? Like wonder why they decided not to use those 44 USBs. That's very strange. Shouldn't we open it up? Shouldn't we... Um, you know, look into what's going on. Why are these votes not being counted? And that can't be the only votes that weren't counted. You know, I'm, I'm sure if you, if you, if, if we dig a lot deeper and I'm sure there are people digging a lot deeper into this, they will find that the, de the DNC has not counted certain votes. They will find that the DNC is trying to skew the votes away so that it seems it seems like the majority of the votes actually went to someone like Joe Biden. When in reality, they didn't. The numbers are, are, are falsified or manipulated. The machines are, I mean, they're black box machines. They're black box voting machines, right? They're, they're like not... Um, they're not secure and the propriety proprietary codes are owned by the corporations the diebold corporation owns the the codes and they're not publicly verified and that's just in this election that's just 2020 that this stuff was was, was revealed if we go back and look further 2016 is almost play by play the exact same just replace biden with clinton Right, just replaced Bloomberg with Clinton, and that's exactly what was going on. Um, so the DNC was sued for this stuff in 2016. And in front of a judge, the DNC said that it is our legal right to cheat and pick the candidate that we want. The DNC and the RNC as well, they're both private corporations that control our elections. That means the private sector is the one making the decisions. Just based on that fact alone, you can see that the private sector is what is controlling our election system on a primary level. On the primary level, the direct Democrats are doing this. And then there was an MSNBC interview where someone from the DNC was basically like, yeah, no, look, the party picks the candidate, the party picks the nominee, and then you get to vote for who you who we tell you you should vote for as a Democrat. You don't get to make that actual choice. That's that's who these Democrats are. And that's that's how they kind of work the system. And to them, this is necessary, right? This facade of this facade they run in the primary system for voting is absolutely necessary because there were two instances where we saw at least two instances that, that I've been able to find. Um, I'm sure that there are more instances of this in possibly lower uh, down ballots, uh, down ballot vote elections. But there are two instances in history with, with presidential elections, specifically where, you know, the candidates circumvented the, um, the voters, the electorate, the constituency, and they went straight to the delegates. The people that are really making the decision of who gets to be the nominee. 
right? It's it's not it's not us. It, it all goes to that convention where the delegates make that choice. The delegates are the ones that say, hey, this guy is your nominee and you got to vote for this person. And if you don't vote for this person, you're voting for the opposition, right? That bullshit argument that they throw out there. Um, so the first one is 1912 with Taft versus Roosevelt that brought this election up uh, before. Uh, Taft got the nomination because he directly skipped the constituents and went for the delegates. And he, was ba and he basically talked to the delegates, got a bunch of funding, and then he won the nomination for the Republican Party in 1912. And Theodore Roosevelt looked at that and was like, nah, this is bullshit, son. This is bullshit. This ain't how you play this game. And so he created his own party. He created the Bull Moose Party and went against Taft. Uh, who he pointed out was skipping the voters and that the voters don't make the calls. And he got 20% of the vote. Now, Theodore Roosevelt and Taft had name recognition. Woodrow Wilson had name recognition. They also had a ton of money behind them. <laughs> um, so, so they were able to get a good amount of votes when they created... Uh, the Bull Moose Party, a um, lot of name recognition, especially the name recognition was, was I think, big in terms of creating um, this, this new party. Uh, so then in 1968, you got Hubert Humphrey, who didn't campaign in any state, but won the Democratic nomination uh, because the delegates picked him. And it showed people that they, like, weren't, like, the votes didn't really matter, right? Like, the electorate didn't really matter. They don't give a shit about the electorate. And there were a bunch of riots. So then the DNC was like, all right, we'll do it differently. In the 1972, they went with a popular vote. And the people picked George McGovern, who was an anti-war left-wing populist that some people might say is pretty similar to um, Bernie Sanders, right? And, uh, and then the DNC basically tanked the election for him. He went up against Nixon and won one state. I think he won Massachusetts because they ran a fucking Red Scare smear campaign against their own guy. They were just like, fuck it. We don't want, we don't want this person to represent the Democratic Party because that's not what the Democratic Party is supposed to be. Okay, the Democratic Party is supposed to be the party of corporations with a blue tie. It's very, it's very important. The color of the tie is really important because then you figure out what team you're on, um, and uh, and uh, th then it doesn't matter because you get money anyway. Now, uh, you know the 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 Republicans play this money game as well. They they also play this money game, and they also play this um, defrauding the voter game where they make sure that your votes don't get counted, that you make sure that your votes don't get seen. The way they do it is with gerrymandering. They, they redraw these state lines, right? Or, or these, um, these uh, vote lines, they pick their own constituents and shit like that. Uh, some of these, the way they redraw these lines is fucking crazy. <laughs> like, I think one of them looks like a dong. Like there, I, I I remember seeing an image uh, a while back, uh, where where it just uh, it's it's like one of these gerrymandered um, sections or whatever you want to call them, uh, just just look like a penis, and uh, and it was like oh yeah uh, of course Republicans didn't see that because they're all sexually repressed so they probably haven't even seen their own junk in quite some time. Um, you know, because Jesus doesn't want them to look at their dongs. Uh, that means you're gay or whatever. I don't, I don't, I don't know how that thought process even works. But uh, Republicans use this thing called interstate crosscheck, which primarily votes in uh, in general elections. It, this, this doesn't really work work a whole lot in the primaries for them. Um, it, it is a tactic specifically built to uh, decrease the amount of votes that the Democrats are going to get. Basically, what it does is it looks through the registry of people that voted, and let's say there is a, um, there's a Chris Mohan in Pennsylvania, and then there's a Chris Mohan in Virginia, and they go, uh-oh, 
there's it, this is the same name. It skips middle names. It skips um, junior, senior. Um, you know, it could be Krish Mohan the third. It doesn't matter. It looks at the last name and the and it goes, oh, there's a Mohan here. There's a Mohan here. What's the first name? Oh, it's Krish Krish. Uh oh, th this looks like it might be the same person. It doesn't go beyond that. And then it removes both the voters. Now, primarily, this affects minority voters. It affects black voters, uh, and it affects voters that that uh, reasonably vote Democratic. They vote for the Democratic Party. Uh, so it removes them from the from the ballot under the claims. Of, oh, it's it, it's getting rid of, you know, people that vote twice. They're voting twice, which has literally never been proved. It's, it's like there I think there might have been like one case of it or something like that. Like it's literally like it's such a minuscule amount of people that do it. It's it's like the people like that are like uh, um like it, it's like some crime that's so outrageous and over the top and they're like we have to make sure that epidemic stops you know of it's like can like people that are just like serial cannibals there's like 10 of them and they're like we gotta stop this epidemic of cannibalism across this country there's a wave there's people eating people everywhere you're gotta be scared of it and it's just like what there's like 10 of them and they're all kind of i think they're all in prison they're all, I think they're all in prison right now. It's crazy. Like, they're all, you know, and it's just like, so this has never happened. And they're like, hey, we got, this is, this is how we stop it. We are putting an end to these people. They're just crossing. Like, even if I wanted to, think of how absurd that is. From Pittsburgh, just to get to Northern Virginia is four and a half hours. So that means I would have to wake up, go in, and let's, I, I would never fucking vote for Joe Biden. Um. You know, so I go in and I vote and let's say I make a vote for Dario Hunter from the Green Party. Right. I go in at eight o'clock. I'm the first one I hit that Green Party button and then I get into my car and I hike it. I'm just fucking hauling ass. Right. And then from like and then I get to Virginia around, let's say, 1 p.m. Around 1 p.m., I get to Virginia. I find a polling station. I have to figure out how to get a re Virginia regi a voter registration, right? Uh, uh, you know, let's say I, I, I've, I've done it through some shady means. I met a guy in a back alley. So by 3 p.m., I find a polling station, right? After I've, I've, I've done this shady backdoor fucking clothes hanger voter registration, and I go in and I cast my second vote. Boom. Do you really think I'm going to use my own name when I do that shit, first of all? And second of all, holy shit, is that a long day? Dude, I don't have time for that. I did, like, nobody has the time for that. Most people don't even get the day off to vote. Most people have to figure out how to vote in between their jobs. Like, how are we going to cross state lines? You know, even to get to, like, Youngstown, Ohio is an hour from where I'm at. How are the, how are, what, what is the, the, the rationale to do that? That's such a waste of time. It's so crazy, but that's what they do. They, they use this interstate cross-check program to look at last names and first names, and that's it, and they'd start taking voters out. And sure, yes, there is a possibility that it'll affect, you know, uh, some Republican voters. But again, it's middle class voters. So to them, who gives a shit? It's not really that important. They bought their way out of the election. We just have to make it look like, um, you know, we got to make sure that these these popular vote numbers are are manipulated just enough so that there's more bickering and argument within within the the average citizenship, and and then we can just keep using money to control their elections anyway. Because, again, the RNC, just like the DNC, is a private corporation that controls their elections. The one thing that, you know, with, with this delegate process, that's a similarity. This, this voter corruption, the, the way that they manipulate vote, that's a similarity between the two parties. Um, both parties have a, a, a problem with money. It takes a lot of money to run these elections. It takes a lot of money to uh, run as a can like a candidate. You know, in most cases, candidates 
that win are like they they spend millions of dollars, billions of dollars in some cases. Like Hillary Clinton spent, what was it like? Like billions of do- I think like two billion dollars, or something like that. That's so fucking nuts. Two billion dollars, and then she still lost, which I think is why she's pissed. Uh, like, like she hasn't let go of it. She keeps talking about. It, and then she keeps, like, blaming other people for it. She's like, well, Russia, well. You know, it's like, boom, Russia, boom. Like, it's just it, fucking... Dude, you were a bad candidate. Just accept that you were a shit candidate with shit policies that nobody wanted to support because you come from this, like, political dynasty of bullshit. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> it takes a lot of money. The, I think there's like a minimum amount of money that you have to reach um, just in order to be able to run. Uh, and there's a guy by the name of Lawrence Lessig. Uh, I'm not sure if you guys know who Lawrence Lessig is. Um, I've, I've watched a couple of his TED Talks. Uh, I've, I've listened to him on Rogan. I, he's, he's a really good speaker, and he really the way that he presents information, um, I really like it, and I recommend you guys go check him out. Uh he talks about this idea that um, candidates will spend most of their time fundraising. It, from the second that they're elected to, they, they're, the, a majority of their job is just fundraising, fundraising for the next election so that they can hold on to their seat. 30 to 70 percent is dialing for dollars is what, uh, is what he said. Um, and, this way, and then he just keeps asking people for money, right? Um, or he or she, whoever the candidate is, uh, they just ask for, for, they just try to fundraise. It's most of their job. The most of their job is fundraising so that they can uh, get reelected. It's not actually legislating and doing the work for the people. Um, it's making money and deals with corporations and the elites, right? And, and, that's what, and that's a lot of what it is. It's not like, you know, fucking Mitch McConnell is calling the, uh, you know, fucking small business bakery owner in Frankfort, Kentucky. He's called the dude that owns the fucking coal mines in Kentucky and is like, yo, you want to drop some hard cash into my, yo, you want to campaign for me? You want to tell your employees that they should vote for me? Shit like that. In 2016, uh, half of the money that uh, that funded these campaigns, half of the money in, in that funded the political campaigns in 2016, in the 2016 election, which started in 2015, by the way, five years ago, uh, came from 400 families. Um, so that is $5,200 is the maximum individual contribution that you can make um, in... Uh, uh, in, in, in these things. And from that data, um, that would be 57,854 people that made that maximum contribution of $5,200. The main individual contribution of $5,200. That's 0.2% of our population. Hong Kong did the same thing, where 0.2% of the populace that was pro-business and pro-corporation made a decision about who the nominee is going to be. And then they presented that to the people and the people were like, see, you get to vote for these two. Now, students rioted against that. They pro- Well, they didn't riot. It's the wrong word. Sorry about that. Uh, they protested against it. Um, but, you know, electability and credibility is only determined by the candidate that has the most amount of money. Joe Biden gets funded by super PACs. Joe Biden gets funded by um, billionaires that make this individual $5,200 contribution. And then they'll put money into super PACs that essentially campaign for Joe Biden. Um, credibility is determined by money. 
0.2% of the people control who becomes that nominee, who we get to see in that presidential uh, uh, race from these two major parties. This is not democracy for the people. This is democracy for the funders, which is a plutocracy. It's an oligarchy where the rich determine who the leaders are. And the leaders are going to do what these funders want them to. And there's proof that that's how it works, too. Um, there's a Princeton study that basically showed uh, that when it comes down to making legislation in, in relation to the views of economic elites versus special interest groups, um, what that looks like when, when they reach a majority. So check this out. For economic elites, the more, uh, the more preference there is, the more uh, likelihood um, that the, uh, the legislation is going to pass. Right, so you're looking at uh, predicted probability of adoption. Or that's 0.7, so that's like 70 percent. By the time it gets to 100 percent, you're looking at a, a, a 40 percent of the cases are at least going to get 70 percent of the consideration. Let's go to a different one. Special interest groups. Same thing. There's a nice little spike once you start getting to more and more people. And then when you look at the average citizens, doesn't matter. It's about a 20% about a chance that this shit gets done. About a 20% chance that when we call for progressive ideologies, about a 20% chance, regardless of whether it's 10% of the people asking for it, or 100% of the people asking for it. Compare that to this. Boy, that's a different spike, isn't it? Or this versus that. It's the money, baby. It's inequality. It's inequality in the electoral process means that our electoral process is controlled by the rich. And that's a Princeton study that did it. I mean, that's a pretty um, pretty corporate school. Uh, and, and, and this goes against what most of our founding fathers actually wanted for this country. They wanted the voice of the people to determine, um, you know, what, what the direction of this country was supposed to go in. And we are going against that because what we have done is say, well, if you have more money, then you have more of a voice. And that's just straight up wrong. And that's really what's wrong with our democratic process. That it's not, the, it does, it's not representative of the voice of the people. It's representative based on how much money you have in your bank account. My voice doesn't matter that much because I don't have that much in my bank account. According to this system, that's how it operates. Because I can't throw in $5,200 at a candidate that I like, I threw maybe five bucks into Tulsi Gabbard's campaign. And, uh, and that's really all I could afford because the rest of it went into making sure I was paying my bills making sure there was gas in my tank, making sure that there was food on my table, um, making sure that uh, you know I was able to pay the people that I needed to pay that were opening my shows when I was able to pay them, all that stuff. So I threw a little bit in. And because of that little bit, according to, according to this electoral process, um, my voice doesn't really matter all that much. And the candidate that I supported doesn't really matter all that much because the, be, I, either it was Tulsi or Bernie, it didn't matter because they weren't taking corporate money, because they weren't being funded by these special interest groups. They don't really matter. They don't have legitimacy or credibility behind what they're saying. 
That's the problem with the electoral system that we are working with today. Hey, thank you so much for checking out this video. If you are new to this channel, uh, make sure you hit that subscribe button and hit that bell so you get notifications when uh, I put up new videos. I'm going to be putting up videos every single day, so there's going to be a ton of content coming out on this channel. Uh, there's going to be storytelling, uh, commentary about the media, uh, historical commentary, philosophical commentary, all surrounding uh, stand-up comedy. If you, if you like comedic commentary about these topics, then this is the channel for you. Uh, and if you uh, come to the channel often and you haven't subscribed, what, 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 what are you waiting for? What are you waiting for? Hit that subscribe button. Get, get, get subscribed to this. Come, come hang out with us. <laughs> But uh, for more information about me, you can go to my website, uh, ramannoodlescomedy.com. That's R-A-M-A-N, noodlescomedy.com. Uh, while you're there, you can check out all of my past stand-up comedy albums, which if you snag them from Bandcamp, are available as Pay What You Want, which means that they're uh, available for free. Uh, you can check out past videos. You can check out past podcasts. And uh, you can donate if you have the ability to make a one-time donation or become a sustaining member. You can donate directly on my website and become a sustaining member directly on my website. And Or you can see how, you know, the various different ways that you can make a donation. And you can also find out about live stand-up comedy events. Well, live-ish stand-up comedy events. I'm going to be doing uh, a test show on Zoom. Uh, tickets are available for that right now. They are free, and there's only 10 spots available. This is going to be a test show to find out, you know, what format's going to work, if there are technical difficulties that I need to figure out, and then figuring out uh, what consistent day to try to do um, these Zoom shows. I'll probably do a couple of them uh, while we are uh, currently in the quarantine situation. So, that is available. Uh, the tickets for that are available right now. There's only 10 spots available. Uh, so make sure that you grab them um, before they're all gone. And then once we decide the date for the first official live-ish stand-up <laughs> comedy Zoom show, the virtual stand-up comedy show, uh, there will be um, about 15 tickets available for the first one. Uh, and then we'll, we'll go from there and we'll see, see what happens from there. Uh, so grab those tickets and come hang out with us uh, on the Zoom. Uh, like I said, make sure that you're subscribed. Make sure that you hit that like. Make sure that you share this out. Get the word out about these videos. And uh, and you can go to my website to find out more stuff. Uh, Till the next video. Take it easy.